What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Chad Townsend Show. And on today's episode, speaking to someone who, when I decided to get the podcast back up and running, I was like, I'm going to get this guy on. And I've been a big fan of his uh, throughout his whole career. Doesn't play anymore, but I'm going to read you some stats. 168 NRL games, 12 origins for Queensland, 12, tats, 12 test matches for Australia, one NRL premiership, one World Club Challenge, and Daily M Halfback of the Year in 2017. Please make him welcome, Michael Morgan, mate. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> thanks for the, the I guess, the stats read too. <laughs> don't hear them often anymore. I was about to say that. You don't, um, you don't actually hear uh, about those things. You probably haven't heard. You probably didn't even know that you probably played that many games. Oh, uh, I had an idea. I, n- I never know which way to count it, whether it's 168 or 169 with the World Club Challenge because that doesn't count as an NRL game, but I count it. Yeah. I mean, well, we always see up in the facility, for people who may not know, there's a big banner, Michael Morgan there. I look it up <laughs> <laughs> and I see it every I, day. I have seen that one, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, like I said, thanks for coming on. Um, you're someone who I was really keen to chat to um, on the podcast and born and bred in Townsville, mate. Local mm. local boy, now retired um, from the NRL. So um, I want to know, mate, what does Michael Morgan do with himself now you know, post-football? Um, not a great deal. No, I, I've um, look been in obviously eighteen months now since I finished playing, and the transition's been pretty good. Um, I've learnt to appreciate the good things about not playing footy, uh, like having your weekends back and your, your life not being revolved around a footy calendar. So, if you you know, there's always positives in things, and I try and find them. Um, so that's been a good thing. But I've um, look next year taking on a, an assistant coaching role with the Blackhawks, which I'm excited about, and um, yeah, get me. I've started to miss footy a fair bit, so or you know a bit. So it, that gives me a taste, and um, I never would have thought I'd be interested in any sort of coaching. But here we are. We'll see how we go. That was going to be my next question, actually, because. Um you know, you've just signed on to become assistant coach of the Blackhawks, the Queensland Cup team up here in Townsville. Uh, you know, what brought that on? And like you said, you, you didn't think you'd be coaching, but why why are you in coaching now? Um, because Painty just asked if I'd be interested. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it's no awesome story. I was, um, I think I was driving in the car one day and Painty's, uh, Aaron Payne, who, who I actually played with years ago when I was starting my career as well. So I've always had a, you know, a bit of a relationship with him and, he called me out of the blue one day and asked if I'd be interested in giving them a hand. And he actually asked, would I be interested in coaching as in the 18s or 21s or an assistant under him? And I didn't, you know, I don't know what type of coach I'll be. I've never done it before. And it's something that I didn't, while I was playing, I didn't think I'd be interested in. Uh, but so I chose the assistant role for that reason. I can sort of get a taste for it, see, you know, learn and see what type of coach I'll be. What type of, what type of coach do you think you'll be? I mean, your resume obviously speaks for itself and obviously you would have played under a number of coaches who had different me- different methods. Mm-hmm. Do you, yeah, do you think you'll be, you know, hands-on, uh, you know, very firm, you know, direct? Um, look, I'll, I'm probably pretty relaxed normally, uh, but... I, I was coached under a number of very good coaches too, so I'll try and take a few of the strengths of theirs that I sort of benefited from, I guess, and see if I can implement them in my own way. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not too sure. I, I think I'll be more hands-on. I'm lucky that, you know, rugby league years, I'm relatively, well, sorry, general life, I'm relatively young. <laughs> rugby league years, I'm older, you know, 31 at the end of the year. So, um, like, I can still get in there and actually do a bit too, which I enjoy, and get my hands on the footy and help out where I can. Yeah, I love that. All right. As I said off the top, mate, you now you're retired from rugby league. Uh, what – I want to talk about, about your retirement because it happened, you know, pretty suddenly, um, probably a bit of a shock to yourself. Um, talk me through about the reason why you retired and I guess how it all happened. Yeah, it, I mean, it was and it wasn't a shock. I was dealing with the shoulder for – uh, oh, a few years in the end and when I finally decided to get the surgery which um, I didn't really want to do um, and you Is know, that was, a reconstruction? Yeah so yeah. I had a ladder it's called a ladder procedure so that it's bone block so 
because they put foreign objects, so a couple of screws in there, and then after it, and I was training, I was back training, doing rehab with Ash at the club, and it was just not getting any better. And about 10 weeks in, I couldn't do anything. It was still sore every night. I was painkillers and anti inflams every night because it was really sore after training that day, and I was getting nowhere with it. So then I'd load up on painkillers and anti-inflammes that night, hoping it'd be better again the next day, sort of to cover the pain, but try and get it good for the next day. So it was a fair process and it ended up being infected. So that's why I wasn't getting anywhere with it. Got it cleaned out um, and came back and played, I think, two games at the back end of 2020 and then tore my calf. So I missed the four, last four weeks because of that. Um, and going into 2021, I knew that there was a chance. I didn't know how the shoulder was going to go. I, I knew that there was a chance that because of the infection, it was a lot weaker and I, it may not hold up. So I went into the preseason and did it as best as I could. I've never looked after my body better than what I did in that time. So I was always pretty relaxed with my you know, prehab and that kind of thing. I'd rather sit around and have a chat with the boys before training than look after my body. But that year, yeah, I was there an hour before anyone else there. Uh, an hour after everyone else as well trying to get it right and I just wanted to give myself every chance for it to be okay um, I didn't want to just get through the pre-season and then uh, it you know goes round one I wanted to know that I gave it a good crack which I did but unfortunately yeah it was round two against the Dragons and just in a normal tackle and I just felt a big crunch through it and that was I guess this well it was the screws breaking and the shoulder sort of loosening again and um, yeah that was the end of it. Do you think, did it come on like through, you know, repeated sort of blows or was it just like gradual sort of wear and tear of playing in the NRL? Um, well, originally it was loose. So it, the before I had it done, it was, it came out, oh, I reckon 10 times through the preseason, was just subluxing all the time. And then the first two games, I think we played Broncos round one and it would have happened three times in that game, played Bulldogs round two about five times, four or five times in that game. And that's when I thought, geez, I'm not going to get through the season. And then we went into the COVID break. So that gave me a chance to go, okay, well, maybe this is a good chance to get it done. We didn't know how long the comp would be stopped for. Um, and the plan was to miss the first four games after COVID. I missed the first 10, I don't know, like plenty because it was infected. So it just pushed everything back. So it, mentally it was a tough year. It was probably the toughest year of my career, to be honest. So I was always pretty relaxed through my career. Um, but that was the first time I'd sort of, really struggled mentally with trying to get myself back. We weren't going well as a team, uh, so we were losing. And even though I wasn't playing, I felt more pressure that year than I ever did before. Um, so, yeah, it was it was difficult, and uh, but, yeah, got through it. So you've, <clears throat> you've had the injury for a, a couple of years, and then, you know, you got to a point where you're like, I just, I just can't keep going on, I can't keep going on. Then you obviously make the decision to retire, with you know medical advice and looking after yourself and um, you know looking for your your health down down the track, how was how were you the moment you were like you know you might have spoken to your wife and the, the doctor and said look it's time for me to to hang it up was it were you a bit emotional or was it like was it like a weight off your shoulder to be like look I don't have to I don't have to do this anymore it was it was <laughs> I, I remember when I told Toddy because. He said, go away for a couple of days, give it a, you know, have a good think about it and um, come and see me when you've made your decision. And we were about to start training one day and um, I obviously wasn't doing too much at, for training. I was just there hanging around the group. And when I told him it, it was, it was relief was the first thing. But then I went away that night and um, it felt like I was just giving up as well because for so long you... You fight, get, yeah. Yeah, you get injured and then it's, okay, you're diagnosed with what the injury is. All right, what do I need to do to get back? And that's you attack it so there was a part of me that really felt like I was just giving up um and I went home that night so I had a a number of nights where I questioned it and whether I was doing the right thing and then Bree my wife she said well how bad does it need to be before you to decide that that is enough um she said is it that you really can't use your you know your shoulder well anymore you we had Penelope who was six months at the time and um and that made me think okay well maybe that is enough that sort of you know clicked for me a bit bit that was I just going to go until it physically couldn't do anything else with it? Or um, So that's calmed me with a decision, I think. But, yeah, big sigh of relief, but also giving up. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't imagine how tough it must have been, um, you know, especially when you probably would have been playing footy, you know, since you're five, six years old to just, you know, have that thought process of being like, I cannot do it, I cannot go any, any mm. further. But you just mentioned, um, you know, your daughter Penelope um, and th – 
you, I heard you say the other day that uh, the shoulder injury and having a little girl daughter um, in a similar time allowed you to spend some more time you know, with your daughter at home. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And it was a, it was a good distraction, I think, because often you hear people struggle with that transition after they finish. And um, I tried to put a, you know, a more of a positive spin on it. It gave me a lot of time with her. So that's a very important time in a child's life too. And it, it was a lot of fun. So we have a very, very good relationship now. And I'm very lucky because normally not everyone gets to do what I, what I did. Um, you know, the time that I got with her at that age, um, not many people get to do that. So I was very lucky for that. And even, you know, looking back at my career when I finished it was all right well I got to do plenty I was grateful for what I got to do and um but yeah that sort of and it was Easter the following no Easter that year the year I finished and that was the first full Easter weekend I had at home since I was 17 so and we happened to have a daughter then too so that's when I thought okay you know life's pretty good I'm I'm in a good place and I'm, I'm very lucky to have got to do what I did but now finish and spend spend so much time with my family. What advice would you give to our current NRL players who, I guess, are near the transition to retirement? I mean, you obviously went out in a way that was kind of out of your control, but maybe for players who are in that same position or players who might have a year or two or a couple to plan that transition to retirement. Do you have any advice for those guys? Um, look, it is... I've thought about, you know, if I would have done things differently in my career to plan for after footy. Um and I don't know what I would have done differently because while you're there and, you know, you're, you're very, I guess, uh, motivated to do a few things outside of footy. Not everyone's like that. Not, any, not everyone can, whether it's be bothered or find the motivation and, and put that time and effort in. So um, I, I don't know if I'd do anything different, but from a mental perspective, it would be get yourself ready for, you know, rugby league and playing footy gives you the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But the highs are so good and you don't, experience those highs in everyday life you just don't so I was I got my head around that pretty early that the you know the just the feeling of winning a game it you know you feel on top of the world and uh, because you're doing it with the group of your good mates who you work so hard with through the preseason and then through the week and um, so be ready to miss those lose those moments because it doesn't happen anymore but be grateful that you got to experience those moments because not everyone does and where do you you just spoke about the highs and i Definitely can vouch for what you just said. The highs are very high, the lows are low. You know, I guess you'd say you're, you know, now you live a you know, somewhat normal life outside of football. Where do your highs come from now? Um, my kids, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, it, it really does. Um, and they're so simple. It can be, you know, Penelope, she's two and a half now, so she's at a really fun age and they're always developing and doing something different. And uh, they require, as you know, they require a lot of your time and attention. But, um, yeah, I love it. So I'm... Yeah, it, that's where I find a lot of enjoyment in life. Yeah, beauty. All right, let's talk a bit about um, your NRL career. Now, I want to wind it back to uh, your NRL debut. Um, I want to know who did you play against. I want to know how did you find out that you were making your debut and you know what were you like, I guess, realising you know, you're about to accomplish everything you wanted to do in your whole life. Yeah, we played the Roosters um, in round, I think it was round nine in 2010. So, long time ago now. Um, yeah, so JT was injured. He hurt his shoulder. And then we Neil Henry called me in. He was the coach at the time. Called me in on the Monday morning and told me that I'd play that weekend. But that was when Monday night footy was around. So, we had the Monday night game the following weekend or that weekend. So, I had to wait all week. And I was <laughs> – so, I had to watch every single game. And I just thought, geez, I – and I, you know, the whole say, don't play the game before it happens and don't try not to think about it. <laughs> I was shitting myself all week. Cause, so I just turned 18 that off season, or sorry, over the Christmas period. And yeah, so round nine, like I finished school the year before. So I was like, I was questioning, am I ready for this? Because, and I'd never played against men before. I'd put the highest level I'd played was under 20s. Yeah. And I soon found out that the level, it, was, it, it didn't compare. It was completely different. So yeah. Um, yeah, but got through the week and then Monday night down at, well, it was SFS then, the old Allianz Stadium. Um, yeah, and we got a win actually, which yeah, was good. cool because the club, Cowboys only won five games that year oh. and that was one of them, so I was pumped. <laughs> so uh, the coach tells you on Monday that you're going to debut the following Monday. Yeah. Man, it, that is, how do you sleep? Uh, not very well. I, and the closer it got to the game, so over the weekend we were staying in Coogee, Um 
and I was rooming with JT. He was out, and I was feeling, and that's what else. I was feeling for him, so I was wearing his number seven jersey, and I thought, and then I was rooming with him, um, and I thought, you know, I just was pinching myself that, um, yeah, I was sharing a room with him and filling in for him, and the build up around it was a lot. I mean, North Queensland local kid who you know went through the pathway system and was now got to make his debut, so. There's a bit of build up around it, and um, yeah, I was pretty nervous, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then that's pretty cool. All right, so you know, as most young guys come onto the scene, not everyone, I guess, you know, comes on and you know just plays first grade for the rest of you know their whole career. Many guys, young guys, have to prove themselves. You know, um, when did you, I guess, cement yourself as like a regular first grade where you're like, look, I now like this is my spot. I am here, and I feel comfortable. When yep. was that? Um, well, I thought it was a couple of times, but then you get brought back down to earth. So not, I debuted in 2010, probably not till 2014. So it took four years. So I played four games in 2010, four games in 2011. Um, and then 2012, I started the year in the Queensland Cup and finished the year from halfway onwards in, in first grade, played semi-final footy that year too. So it was a cool experience. And after that season, I thought, how good is this? You know, I felt like a, a first grader and... Went into 2013, uh, broke my jaw in the pre-season trial, so I missed the start of the season, and then uh, played a couple of games, and they weren't very good, and that's what I mean, I was just on the roller coaster then, learning what it was like, and so went back to Q Cup again, had other dra- well, dramas away from footy, uh, personal things that I went through during that year, and played a majority of that season, I think I played 13 games, ended up in, in the Queensland Cup, and maybe the same in NRL and after that year I thought you know I was in and out and I thought okay maybe I'm not going to actually cement a spot and then 2014 happened and I got an opportunity at fullback uh Greening took over the club and um it was a fresh it really felt like a fresh start and Cootie unfortunately went down at the nines with an ACL and got my opportunity at fullback and loved it yeah awesome that is I mean it's funny it's not funny but it's like you just spoke about the the rides, the high and the lows of, of an NRL career. And for, for people out there who might not know, like you make your debut in 2010, but you don't necessarily feel like you've got your actual spot until 2014, which is like five years later. Yeah. You know, go through setback. You just mentioned broken jaw, um, injuries, um, you know, other players getting injured, you coming into your spot. That's, you know, what we spoke about before with the, the roller coaster. Describe to me, like, what is an NRL career? Like you've, you've been and gone and done everything in the game, but if you could describe what an NRL career is, and I think I might know what you're going to say. But, <laughs> <Yeah, how word. laughs> no, but it is, I mean, and the other thing that, you know, I'd, that happened through that period when I was in and out and I'd played in the halves before, like, well, that's all I'd played. And so I was thinking to myself, maybe I don't, you know, I wasn't really enjoying playing in the halves. So the fullback opportunity came at a good time, but you know, they'd also be, because I, I hadn't cemented a spot, they were also signing other players to play in the halves. So I'd be like, you know, in my head, I was like, well, they're ahead of me anyway. So I was then down the pecking order again. So it's not all sunshine. There are, there are plenty of tough times, as you know it. But, um, you know, we're often judged on the 80-minute performance each week. But, the yeah, the, the challenge, I guess, for a lot of guys, I mean, the average ga- uh, game is like 40 in the NRL. So... I played with guys who played one game. I played with guys who played 300 games. And, you know, it really is, you, you never, I don't think, you're never just there comfortable. Like, you never make it. And then, you know, I thought making it to the NRL was hard, which it was, but staying there yep. was even harder. I cannot agree with you mm. anymore. Like, it is unreal. Like, the sacrifice, dedication it takes to get to the NRL, but then to, like, stay there. Because every year, like, there's a young... There's kids that come up. There's the next big yeah. thing. There's the 18 year old just come out of school and he's yeah. snapping at the heels and yeah. he wants your position or he wants you know he wants the squad and continually like I think that's where you know if you want a long career you need to consistently prove yourself year after year. You cannot rest on what you done the previous year because I guess what you did the previous year the success you had it probably ain't going to help you. It doesn't really matter anymore. It doesn't yeah. really matter yeah. anymore. It might get you a start the yeah. following year, yep. but uh, then you've got it's, to not prove gonna, yourself. Yeah, it's not going to keep you there. Yeah, mm. definitely. Um, mate, what did you what did you love about playing in the NRL? What was the what was your favourite moments you know, around training, the boys, um, games? What, what did you love about it? My favourite moment of the week um, was sitting in the sheds after the game 
have after a win and having a beer that that moment there because your work's done for the week that that is what you're judged on solely is, is your performance on a weekend so when you could sit in there with your teammates and have a couple of beers after a game that was the most enjoyable part for me because the work was done uh you got your you know job done got the win you didn't need to worry about next week yet that didn't matter yet so that was the the time in the week where I thought all right this is where you can really just relax and it was a sense of relief that you got the job done and um you didn't have to do, do the review yet the review didn't really matter because you won like you can learn things from it but you would just you'd go into it differently and then yeah so far away from the next game that it doesn't matter just yet so that moment right there is what I enjoyed I can definitely definitely agree with that and I didn't probably didn't appreciate it until I got a bit older too. Yep. Um, so often, and the the more I went through my career, you'd see young guys get in, look on their phones, flick through, go and have a shower, and get out of there. I was like, you'll miss. This is a thing you'll miss. Like I don't miss playing footy. Like I, I do, but that's not the number one thing I miss. It's that moment sitting around there having a beer after the game. That's the moment I miss the most. Yep. Definitely. I, I, that's one of the, my favourite things ever um, about what we do. What did you? What did you? What was your least? Favorite part? What did you not like around you know a certain training session, uh, you know travel, game um, preparation? Was there anything, uh, you know, a certain style of training that we have to do at training preseason <laughs> as a whole? <laughs> yeah. um, no, well, see, I liked traveling. The, the away games were fun because you go down, you're there for what two nights, and you, you're away with all your mates. So it was it was actually fun. I enjoyed it. Um, Look, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't love pre. No one loves preseason. There's some guys who just live and breathe, it, love training and training hard, and that just wasn't me. <laughs> so, uh, the one point two, I, I, I was uh, never a fan of that. Um, yeah. What was the PB in the one point two? Four forty eight. Is this still? Once and yeah. it, it's a funny story actually. The year I got that, so I had to be back and in in the halves. We then had to get under four fifty. I yep. don't know what it is now. So I did it the first day back. Got four fifty four. So I'm like, oh, so close. <laughs> did it the following week, 4.53. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then did it again, 4.51. And then, so you've got to keep doing it until you get your target each week. And then finally, four weeks in, yeah, got just got under. Yeah. And I was ruined for the rest of the session. <laughs> there was nothing else. They got nothing else out of me. How, how did you mentally get yourself up for things that you didn't like to do? Like I always say, you know, successful people have a habit of doing the things that failures don't like to do. That's a little quote I've heard. And I know there's a lot of things in the NRL which are unbelievably good and great. There's a lot of things that I guess are really tough, like you just said, pre-season. Like sometimes, you know, three and four sessions a day, early starts, late finishes, absolute grind, things that you you don't necessarily want to do, but you do it and you, you get through it. So, you know, how – what type of stuff? Um, yeah, well, look, I was probably lucky because when I came into first grade, I was getting trained by Billy Johnson. So as an 18-year-old – because before I made my debut, the reason what well they said you're not we don't think you're fit enough, so we need you to get fitter. So I was training Mondays back then. No matter how many minutes you played, Monday morning for everyone was conditioning first thing back. Jeez. Um, so I was doing that, and then Tuesday morning, injured squad. They, I had to go for I had to join in with the injured squad. So we'd go on a 50k ride around town on the Tuesday morning. Wednesday. They had a thing called the 50 Club. So we'd do weights, 50 Club during the day, which is if you didn't play 50 minutes of NRL, you had to do a cardio session plus the opposed session that afternoon. Thursday was the day off. No, Thursday was contact and then captain's run Friday. So I was getting flogged. That was in season too. So getting through that gave me confidence that no matter what sessions we did, while I didn't necessarily enjoy it, I, I knew I could get through it. And I was probably more, uh, you know, I through my career, I, I've always said that I feel like I was very lucky with my career because, to be honest, I didn't work harder than other people. I, I, I literally just enjoyed it. Like, I, I loved going there every day because my mates were there. You know, I'd get through the hard stuff when we had to. I was never leading the fitness, never, you know, the best tackler and ever, anything like that. I just loved doing it. So I was very, I, I feel like I was lucky to get to do what I did. That's awesome, awesome outlook. <clears throat> I want to talk about now um, you and JT and the combination you two had, which was at times unstoppable. And I just remember preparing to play, well, quickly, for people who may not know, uh, you guys were voted, I think, the perfect pairs, <laughs> which is like the greatest yeah. half five. I, I thanked JT for giving me a piggyback <laughs> yeah. into that. Thanks. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like I remember, I uh, we prepared playing against you guys for years and it was an absolute nightmare for us because 
you guys played a style of football where JT would be on on the ball and sort of dictating all the terms and the play, and you would hold yourself on an edge, uh, on the right edge, and you know taking a lot of short sides, a lot of runs, um, but you know would also pop around all around the field. Then you had obviously you know Lachlan Coote who was on the other side of the field as well, who was just as dangerous. But talk to me about the relationship you had with JT and how it was playing with him. I because like I said. Preparing to play against you guys was, and doing the preview was, it was a nightmare for us. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, and it, it took me a bit to get used to. Um, obviously, you know, you come into first grade at a young age, and you're a half. You're expected to talk and direct, and and that's probably why one of, was one of my biggest struggles. And I said I was in and out, and that was why, I, from when I was seventeen or sixteen, seventeen. My coaches would always say, I needed to talk more, you got to talk more. And it just wasn't me naturally. Uh, so it's something that I developed over my career. And the year at fullback helped a lot because uh, it gave me a different perspective in the game. So I was able to sit back a bit more rather than having to be the controlling half or a ha- five, half 5'8". Five, they're both expected to control now, I guess. And it gave me a chance to sit back and just pop up where I want and see different opportunities. So it helped me going back into the following year, I went back into 5'8". And... It helped me, I, I think, because it, it made me see where I could help JT rather than just rely on him to plan everything. So whether that be he was running things and I always had something set, something to go to and helped. So if he, you know, he he's someone who bounces up everywhere. You didn't know what he was going to do. But if he was to come our way, we had something to go to. So I'd send him a message, plan it for him. He could come around and, and we'd play a shape. Um, so that's how I sort of started learning and trying to help in that way. Um, Nearly just been another set of eyes and because he, he was he everyone knew how much of a competitor he was and it's not always easy to plan things when you, you're going as quick as him and you're moving everywhere so if I could have something sh- set let him know what we've got going uh, he could just chime in where he needed to I want to talk about your um, you know the strengths you as a player and I think it's fair to say like you were quite big size for a 5'8 um, very good runner of the ball break tackles um, the way you competed uh, you know, they're obviously, you know, different strengths to JTs, and I guess that's another reason why you guys work so well. But talk to, you know, maybe some of the young guys, the young halves who might be listening now on the things that you would look for when you were attacking, you know, the defensive line. Like, you know, if you had a wide four or where the play the ball was, like what sort of things are you looking at? Is it a slow middle forward? Is it someone turns their shoulders out is it a quick ruck where you want to you know push up and you know follow the dummy half what type of things were were you looking for and, and your strengths in your game yeah um I always used to I I mean it's no huge secret a lot of probably doing it anyway but I used to like when the four man was in the tackle and he was either third man back or you got a front rower coming around to the short side and as you said I used to hold that right edge when we were going really well that was my my job and I'd just keep my eye out down there and I actually remember playing the Sharks a lot and I used to think Wade Graham he got he always he, he likes you know he likes the physicality of the game so he'd get in when he probably at times didn't have to and he'd be slower back at times so Jakey Granville was a hooker he was quick so I said Jake if I tell you like when I'm if I just say go, like go, Jorby, go, he'd show to the open side and burn the marker. Yeah. And then all I did was punch a hole off him. So, um, but this is what I'm lo- saying before. Like, I know yeah, like, these it, are the things that it, I'm saying. It wasn't hard to plan against, I don't think. <laughs> but, like, it was simple. But when you, I don't know, we just didn't go away from what worked. I yeah. guess we, we knew that, um, you know, I knew that I trusted Jorby. I knew he was quick and I'd, he'd get past the marker and I'd just pick a hole and I said if you if the A turns in on you just hit me short if he holds out on me go and he scored plenty of tries and went through plenty of times um just doing that and I mean it's very simple but um (laughs) it helps you know having a forward if they can get a quicker play of the ball and and things like that but that's normally what I'd look for is I just base everything around what the four men was doing and I spoke before about like the the difficulty we had in preparing for you guys and I just remember like we were sitting in video and the coach at the time was saying to us look Michael Morgan out out the back he's going so quick so quick and you know the ability to check and go for a half for people who understand what I'm talking about um you know the the half back to push off the the wide running forward and then get to the half out the back like you were going at lightning speed so that made it obviously very very difficult talk to me a bit about you know your tempo and you know going fast and going slow and you know the differences between I guess attacking the try line 
where you might have to hold a bit more depth compared to, I guess, you know, in the middle part of the field where you can go, you know, a lot quicker. Yeah, well, I used to like attacking further out for that reason. And you, you, you know what it's like. You play against different defensive structures. Some are up and in and jam and some you know, a bit more passive and rely on the half to check and release. And when we had a team like that, that's when I'd enjoy it because I wasn't worried about a, you know, a, a centre or winger just flying in and taking my ribs out, <laughs> uh, big George DeFore or something like that. Yeah. Who did get me a couple of times doing it uh, because it, it, we did do the same thing, and but it worked and it, it was a strength of ours. Um, so, yeah, those times, if it was a passive D, that's when I hit the ball a bit harder and really try and... It's called turn the corner, or turn the corner, I guess. But I'd back myself, as you said, if the the half was checking and releasing, I'd back myself to take him on. If the, and I'd just sort of see what the centre was doing, yep. keep the ball out, and if he turns out, turns his shoulders out, well, I'm just going to show and go. If he turns in, I, I'm hitting short along. So, um, yeah, that's... I used to enjoy those defensive structures a bit more than the, <laughs> the up and in. Because, you, yeah, you need to change your tempo. I, yep. I obviously wouldn't hit the ball as quick. I'd yep. you nearly sometimes don't even come onto the ball. You just rely on them to create the space for you if you yep. back your skill. I think that's a great lesson for, for young halves who are listening that you don't always need to go at 100 miles an hour. Um, the good ones obviously understand, you know, when to go quick, when to go slow. Um, now, like, I want to talk to you about your, your 2017 season specifically. Like, this is the year you won Daily M, halfback of the year. Um, JT out injured. Uh, you put the number seven on your back, and basically you put the team on your back as well. Was this season, I know you guys won the 2015 um, comp, which we'll talk about after this, but was 2017 the season where you thought, hey, like, I am, I am just in control at the moment. This is the most complete, this is the most dominant that I feel as a player? Uh, I did feel good, yeah, um, and I don't know what that was. I don't know if it was um, I was relaxed about it. Halfway through the year, after JT had been out for a couple of weeks, we we had Johnny Asiata. He went to halfback for a bit, um, and Greeny didn't really ask if I'd want to go there. Um, he just sort of put him there because I'd always, I guess, I was comfortable doing what I was doing, uh, playing that role, and it was nearly a se- second fiddle role. That's what it was to JT and. So we, we were trialling Johnny Asiata there, and we had a win, loss, like a couple of wins, a couple of losses. Johnny, really, really skillful, um, but really good ball playing lock. He's probably not a halfback. Um, so one week I went to Green and I said, mate, like, can I go there? Like, let, I'll do it. And then he said, mate, that's what I want you to do. Like, I'm so glad that you came in and told me that. And then so that week I put the seven on and started doing what JT was doing, that or playing that role. And, um, yeah, I don't know what it was. Hey, I... Um, like every time I kicked the ball, it felt good. Every time I you some know, of the passes run, you were throwing, like the pass, it, yeah. things just I don't know they just clicked, and um, I wasn't necessarily doing anything different. I don't know. I was playing a different style. I wasn't playing as explosive or trying to be as explosive as I was. Like I said, when I'd run those lines out the back, there was a bit more control to it, a bit more tempo, and I just picked my opportunities a bit more. Um, yeah, so I was having a lot more touches of the footy, which gave me the opportunity to make more good decisions. That's what I was going to say because you just mentioned you and JT, the way that you guys play was a little bit different. JT on the ball a lot more, touching the ball a lot more, I guess setting you up as someone who would hold the edge. Um, But now then you transition to that guy where you had a lot more touches, a lot more opportunities to kick, pass um, set up plays and you were you were making the most of it unfortunately for us <laughs> because and week, I, I'm week pretty, one <laughs> oh, oh mate this is something that I'll never forget so we obviously Sharks we won 2016 and the following year we finished fifth and you know don't make the top four so it's do or die you guys come in at eight Stephen Bradbury Stephen Into Bradbury it. didn't even know that you I think I'm pretty sure correct me if I'm wrong you guys were already having a few beers the week before because you thought you were out well <laughs> we lost our last round and I was sitting there Bulldogs played the Dragons and we needed I think we need Bulldogs to win um, and I, I had one beer at the start of the game and I'm like oh, I'm too nervous I'll just wait so then I waited and then it went, we, yeah, so we didn't watch it together and then it obviously went our way, scraped in and the Monday we turned up to training was so fun. Like everyone was like, how good's this boys are in the finals? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got lucky. Yeah, you, you know, you beat us, we were out and we were devastated but then you go on to, I think it was beat the Roosters. Beat Parramatta Para, and the Roosters, Roosters in the prelim, yeah. And then into the grand yeah. final against the Storm who, um, towed by know, Melbourne. Yeah, got used in the end. Mm. Um, but what a run. Hey, let's go back to 2015. Um, 2015, the Cowboys win their inaugural Premiership, um, what a season that was for you guys. As you just mentioned before, you know, the consistency of how you guys played, the style of football you played, 
um, the team you guys had. T- tell me a bit about the highs of, the, of that season and what that team was like. Yeah, it was. We had a lot of fun. Well, winning's fun, so yeah. Um, but <laughs> it didn't start so fun. We played uh, the first three games that year. We lost our first one, I think, against the Roosters. And I've heard you speak before about you know using motivation when people say things. Sometime and after that game on the back of the Curie Mail, it said the Cowboys have spent another off season reading about how good they are. Here's here's one you can cut out and keep and it said you stink <laughs> and I thought oh, okay so I screenshotted it at the time um, or <laughs> yeah. took a photo of it and I had a photo of it all year and I thought no nope, we're going to show them round two against the Knights lost again I was like oh, <laughs> maybe they were right round three we, we go down to play the Broncos and local derby big game and uh, we get tailed up four, and they put 40 on us and so that was after the third game so we were 0-3 to start the season and then we got back to the airport here in Townsville and I was talking to JT and we said, we just got to go for a beer somewhere together. So we went down to the Great Northern Hotel. None of us had really been there before, but we thought we just want to go to an old pub where we can sit there, have a beer together, enjoy each other's company and maybe we'll find the answer at the bottom, at the bottom of the schooner <laughs> glass. And someone did find the answer because we went on to win 11 straight after that. Oh, so wow. Yeah, we had a uh, few beers together and a um, few beers into the night and... Yeah, into 11 straight. So we were laughing about it weeks later, saying someone found an answer somewhere and it's worked. So I think you guys wrecked our streak too that year in 20, yeah, 2015. We up to 11 straight and then lost to you guys, I think, down there. Mm, yeah. But worked out all right in the end. So tell me a bit about the team camaraderie. Like you said, winning is uh, it's an infectious thing, winning. It is the best thing, as we spoke about before, after the, sh- after the game in the sheds. Uh, the team camaraderie coming together. Tell me about the closeness of the group and I guess you probably weren't you know I guess classified as a senior player at that stage obviously you know you had the likes of you know JT Thumper Matt Scott sorry um Coops Gavin Cooper um you know tell me a bit about the the influence of the senior players and what they had on on the on the team and and how they brought the the team together yeah they, they were very very good so I was lucky that I got to learn under a lot of good leaders and um what they did is they trained well or they trained hard played that way too but they also had fun and they knew when to have fun and I don't know if that was a reflection of how they did things when they went to origin camp and that kind of thing because I know that that's what Mal's all about is as long as you're training hard you're training well and you're playing well you know things you can do what you want away from footy um so there might have been a bit of that into it but they just set a good example and me as a younger player and most of the younger players looked at them and just followed what they did so they set a good example and there were a lot of them you just mentioned them but then there was also people like Scott Bolton, um, Ben Hannett, who'd been around a long time, Jimmy Tamo. So Rory Cost Jason was another one. So um, they were all really good fellas first, the good footballers, but really good blokes too. And it set an example amongst the, uh, amongst the squad. And for me, it was easy. They set easy examples to follow. So I think that filtered out the the team really well because there were guys who were really good leaders that weren't even in the leadership group. So. Uh, yeah, it was a good squad. And did you did you t- learn some stuff off those guys you just mentioned and, I guess, use it when you were later on in your career as a senior authority or when you were captain of the Cowboys? Did you take some of that stuff and, I guess, use what you thought would work and then, I guess, use that to help some of the other younger guys in the squad? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I tried to. And it was – at times it was difficult because um, we – like we didn't have a group of leaders as strong as what that group was. So it was, and when you have a changeover players, you lose a couple here of the good leaders here and there too. So there was a, a big changeover from 2016 to even if you look two years later, the squad was very different. We lost a lot of those good leaders, replaced them with young players who hadn't been in a successful club before. So it was up to you know myself and a few others to set a good example. And we just didn't have that same group of leaders that we had in 2015 16 through those years so probably a big part of why the you know we we didn't go so well through that that period but um yeah it's you know the toddies you know replaced some people with um you know quality leaders like yourself and um it's it's certainly changed the club around again well let's go back to the, i guess the, the 2015 and you just mentioned you know lose the first three games of the season uh win the next 11 in in a row in command guys are playing well um i assume you guys had the uh luxury of i guess playing the same team each week because usually when you win you know 
you don't really necessarily get many injuries and you're able to put the same team sheet in. People understand their roles. The coaches are coaching at a high level. Um, let's go Let's go straight to the grand final because playing in the grand final against, you know, the arch rivals, the Broncos, mm-hmm. uh, it's a huge build-up. It's a huge game. And I remember watching this game because I was in San Francisco in a okay. hotel room <laughs> At like three in the morning, we were watching on our laptop, and I was like, "I'm going for the Cowboys here. I'm going for the Cowboys here. Underdogs, underdogs." And um, we were making so much noise in the San Fran to police police department come in and try to kick us out of the hotel. And my mates come, "Mate, it's the Australian <laughs> Super Bowl. It's the Australian Super Bowl. You need to let us watch it." But so tell me about a bit about you know the build up to the game, what Townsville was like as a whole, the support you guys received, and then. After that, we'll get into how the game ended. Yeah, um, I mean, it was awesome. And that year was good. So um, it was interesting because after that run, we'd lost a couple. But whatever position we were in in a game, it always felt like we'd win. Um, So we were down, I think, 30 to 6 against Parramatta, down at Parramatta one night with 16 minutes to go. And we ended up winning. And But no matter what the scoreline was or how long was left, it always felt like we were things will be okay and we'll win. And I don't know if that was... We were just full of confidence. We knew that we could turn things on when we needed to. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's weird because the semi-final series, I don't remember it as vividly as I do 2017. I don't know if it's because I was younger and I didn't just take it all in. Like, 2017, I thought, you know, this may not happen again. I want to take it all in and really enjoy it. And 2015, I sort of was just on the, you know, just riding the wave and thinking, how good is this? I think I was 23 at the time. So um, it was pretty cool. And we played – we actually – sorry, again, we not – you, you were at Cronulla then? Nah, no, you I weren't. Was at the Warriors. Yeah. Well, we beat Sharks week. No, we lost the Broncos week one uh, down in Brisbane and then beat Sharks week two. Went, had to go to Melbourne to get into the grand final. And wow. we played really, really good that night. And that's when I thought, yep, we can really do this. And I was so very confident going into the grand final. The build up was massive just given that it was the Broncos. And, um, well, you know what it's like now. The build up just for a normal round game against them is big. So. Yeah, it was really amplified through that week. And let's get into the game because, you know, the last play in regulation time is something that goes down in the history books. The clock's counting down. Um, You guys are behind by four points. Uh, (laughs) The play the ball gets played. Tell me your thoughts at that moment in time because, you know, the ball obviously goes to JT... Bounce, uh, bounce pass. Bounce pass. <laughs> um, it gets flung back over to you. Um, tell me what you saw and what you were thinking at that moment. Uh, it gives me goosebumps. I don't, I don't know. even. I wasn't even I, there. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't really know because I thought the ball was always going to go to JT. It was the last play. Um, <clears throat> so I sort of. I didn't know if he was going to kick it. I just thought try and get it in a position to. Yeah, with the ball, and then when he had to beat a couple, because you got you got yourself, I had to get back you got back him behind because the no ball. No one else. Yeah, everyone was so tight, and yeah. I was like, "Man, watch if you, if you if you see that clip, like watch my watch Morgo, watch him get back behind the ball so he gets in position to get the ball." Yeah, well, even I still thought if he kicks it, someone's got to be able to chase. So he ended up having to just hoik it to me, and um, look, yeah, I don't know, I it, it's all adrenaline and stuff, so I don't remember thinking anything. I think my first thought was actually, "Do I kick it for Felty?" Um, like put it up and just hope for the best and then I was able to run a bit and run a bit more run a bit more and um, because we went down there a fair bit that night as in their left edge because we'd had success previously that year um, against that edge Uh, and we so we went down there all night and they kept turning us away turning us away and I think just because I was able to keep running it just worked out well for me and I spoke before about um, you know passive defensive line and they did have a passive defensive line and, um, yeah, Jack Reed at the time sort of just turned his shoulders a little bit so I could poke my nose through and was able to get the ball away. Mm. Man, it is, it is such a such a cool moment. So, so clutch. But, yeah, Felty gets um, – you obviously get through – with holding the ball in one, arm, one hand, I might add, which is hard as itself, gets through the gap, flick past the Felty. Felty gets through, scores. Now, you know, JT's got a kick to win the game. Like – um, everyone's backing him here. He's going to kick the game. He's going to kick it. He hits the post. He misses. Now it's golden point in a grand final. The biggest moment of your life. Do you remember? Do you remember the message heading into that golden point moment? Um, oh, not really, because 
well, we spoke before JT kicked it that, and the old, the obvious one, whatever happens, whatever's <laughs> next, if he gets it, or if he misses, we expect him to miss it. So talk about what's next. Um, but it was, mate, it was just so loud. And I, I remember thinking to myself when he kicked it, like, I just wanted, obviously just wanted him to kick it because when I was in the 20s, we played the Warriors in the grand final and we lost in Golden Point. And I thought, surely this can't happen twice in a lifetime. Like, to lose in a grand final in Golden Point twice. Um so he missed it, and then I don't know what the talk was after he missed it because he, like, you look at him after it, he looked rattled um, after he missed it, and he was our senior leader. So I remember when we lost the 20s one, we had a kick to win it and uh, unfortunately missed it, and it went to the older point. So I tried to make the point to go straight over to him and say, like, we need you back here with us. Like, now, don't worry about it. It's gone. Um, and it, you see everyone go over and give him a slap on the head and pat on the back and, um, yeah... Luckily, it went our way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, after that, moments after, misses the. F- you just said misses. This is probably why he's the greatest player of all time. Misses the goal to, to win the game. Gets himself back in the moment with the help of you guys. Uh, gets himself in position to kick a field goal. Drops the ball on like <laughs> flat like that. I know, <laughs> worst a statue, drop ever. Hey. There's a statue at Queensland Country Bank Stadium and the ball's like this. Um, but kicks yeah. the field goal. You guys win the NRL Grand Final. Like. Tell me about the, the celebrations and that moment and, and what you thought, I guess, putting your whole life into perspective and everything you'd done for to get yourself to that moment. Yeah, it was um, – I mean, I remember when it went through and I just sprinted straight over, but then you sort of yell and scream in there, everyone's excited, but then I sort of took a step away and just thought, like, you know, we we did it. And the sense of, again, relief that came through me, like it's done, like – all everything that we've worked for is finally like it's all been worth it then in that moment and you're lucky enough to know what that feeling's like and that that was the biggest I guess feeling I had at the time after that initial excitement of actually winning it and the ball going through it was like a sense of relief like it's done and the the celebrations after were a lot of fun we um what was cool and I spoke before about my favorite part of the week to sit and have a beer was how you get to go out on the field and before we went out there and we, it was, we said, no phones, just let's just take us out. No one else needs to experience this. It's just for this group because we're the ones who, who got here. So the, all the staff, the whole squad, we went out, sat in a circle and had a esky in the middle and just sat, it, sat there and had a beer together. with no, So no one else was there. It was just us. No one was – I mean, I know Penrith have won two of them now, but when they're all there on their phones, I just think, like, Put that down and just enjoy that moment because uh, it is very special and not everyone gets to do it. And I'm glad that we did it that way. We made the point of saying no phones. It's just this group because this is who, this is who did it. Um, so that was a really enjoyable moment. Um, and yeah, went on for. We got home and it was awesome. We flew into the airport. There were thousands of people there. Drove to the stadium. There was fifteen thousand people at the stadium just waiting for us. So. Wow. Felt like rock stars and went to um, Vegas as well, didn't you? Yeah, a few, and then we had the presentation ball, so we went out a couple of nights that week. Obviously, had good fun, and I remember sitting on the <laughs> at the um, the Mad Cow. We went there one of the nights and sitting on the bar with Cootie, and we were just thinking, like, how good this is. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a little moment of thinking how good how yeah, good yeah. it was because people, everyone was pumped about it. So people were passing, yeah. yeah, boys, and yeah, yeah. Like, so. Um, and then had the presentation ball on the Friday night, and then Saturday morning flew to Vegas, so. Which with seventeen of us, I think, so it was pretty fun. Wow, mm. some times of your life, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, yeah, it was so much fun, and to be, I, like I said, I, I was twenty three at the time, and you never at that time, you know, I, I was just glad that I won one. And it was a similar feeling to when I played, not a similar feeling, but um, when I played my first NRL game, I thought, well, I could give it away now because I wanted to play the NRL, and I did it, so I played one game. But you get a taste of it, and you just want more, so. After I finished, I thought, yes, like at least I've got one now. Um, but you, it didn't, you didn't lose motivation to try and do it again because you knew how good it was, so you wanted to experience that feeling again. Yeah, wow. All right. Well, we've got a couple of questions to go, mate, then we'll let you, we'll wrap it up. But um, the, obviously, you know, grew up in Townsville, played your whole NRL career in Cowboys colours. Um, you know, over the course of your career, you obviously, you know, negotiate your con- playing contract. And um, I want to know, was there any... Any t- chances you potentially had to leave, opportunities you had to leave the Cowboys and go and play for for another team that you seriously considered over the course of your career? Uh, no, actually, because I 
it, it's home, so all of my family are here. Um, so I was very lucky in that sense, and that's not a normal thing to get to do either, to be in your hometown, stay there your career and um, not have to pack everything up and move. So I was very lucky, and I'd always signed a year, like I was still under contract when I re-signed, so um, I wasn't actually able to negotiate with other clubs and my manager would say, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I don't want to go if they want to keep me. Like, let's just work it out. I didn't want to make a fuss in media or anything like that. I was more than happy to just get it done and carry on living my life. And it, the last one, my last deal, because it was, um, you know, it was off the back of 2017 and there was a bit more made about that, but I was never, it was the same thing. I said that if the Cowboys want to keep me, I want to stay here. So it was an easy process. Yeah, Awesome. Now, you know, post-football life, uh, living the family life now as a, as a dad, um, you've got two beautiful kids. Tell me a bit about what parenting's taught you and, you know, how much you're, in, you're enjoying that at the moment. It's taught me patience, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess you, you just relied upon so much. Uh, but, yeah, I think just being, being patient. I mean, you, you find yourself at times, you don't have your own time and space like you used to. Like I used to get home from when I was playing footy, which... I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. It's no point in telling you. You've got four kids of your own. But when I when I had no kids, I get home from training and do whatever you want. If you want to stay for an hour and a half and have a coffee somewhere with a group, you can. If you want to play golf, you can. If you um, want to get home and play PlayStation, you can. But that's just gone. And you learn to, I, I don't know, I've learned that it's not about just me anymore. And But I, like I said, I, I'm, I love it. Like, it's so much fun, yeah. And you're you're also doing a bit of work on the radio uh, with with Triple M. I've noticed yeah. you're doing some commentary on the sideline, which I see you at our at our games. You also had your your show as well. I think you're doing it on Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings, yeah. Tell me a bit about you know that type of work and you know how much you enjoy that. You know, sitting I guess on the other side of the fence, especially you know commentating games and speaking to the guys after an interview. And do you do you enjoy that? Uh, I do, and it took me a little. It was a bit weird the first time. Calling the games is okay because I, I'm just thrown to for a comment, but I enjoy it because I, I, I obviously want to go to all the game, games here anyway and it, you, know, you get a good seat and you get to sort of be involved in a small way. But, yeah, going out and interviewing the players after the game, um, it's a bit funny because they're all still mates of mine. Like, I know everyone. <laughs> so, like, they just laugh at me and then I laugh at them and sort of try and ask a serious question. And then the other guys ask them a couple as well. And then, um, yeah, so I, I enjoy it for that reason. I'm a bit more comfortable um, to ask people. I mean, because they are friends, I'm happy enough to go up and say, hey, quick chat, and they do it. Yeah, it's good. What are Michael Morgan's hobbies now? What, is he, what do you do for fun? Uh, it was golf. That's sort of going out, gone out the window of late. What, um, what happened? Bad round? Oh, on a number of bad rounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Six week old baby, so things have been. It's been an adjustment there. Um, what else do I do? I mean, I, don't, I don't know. Like I don't. I'm not a big sports watcher. I don't have hobbies like that. I like I said. I enjoy golf. That's probably my main hobby. Um, yeah, I really some simple things in life like getting up, exercising, and being able to sit there and have a coffee by myself. Like I enjoy that. And probably a bit boring to a lot of people, but it's just I don't know a bit of mindfulness. Well, that was going to be my last question to you. Was what what makes Michael Morgan happy? Um, yeah, that, that type of stuff, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it does. And I said earlier, you learn to not expect those highs that you used to have. And I'm probably more, I'm very content with that now. And I'm, um, yeah, I'm pretty lucky to have, like I said, done what I did. Uh, finished, you know, it's not ideal the way I finished, but I look back at it and I, I got to do all of those things. And now I'm, I'm content with where I'm at in life and I'm really enjoying it. Mate, that is, that's awesome. Well, mate, that's that's. We'll wrap it up there, mate. Thank you so much for for coming on today, mate. No, really, thank you. Really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thanks yeah, a lot. It's been a lot of fun. Been a lot of fun. Well, that's it, guys. Another episode in the books of the Chad Townsend Show. If you enjoyed uh, the episode, please make sure you do subscribe. You can check it out on YouTube, uh, Spotify, and iTunes. And we'll be back next week for another episode. We'll see you guys soon.